the idea that it's some sort of bare memorialism, a kind of empty ritual, um, that's simply not how we saw it at all. It's not just knocking down, it's a, it's a new aesthetic notion of liturgical worship. They just don't know what to do with him. And in a way, to this day, we still don't really know what to do with him. Today, I am joined by Dr. Bruce Gordon. Dr. Gordon, thank you so much for being here. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. I am so glad to have you here to talk about one of the major figures of the Reformation, but someone who, as we were just discussing uh, before we hit record here, doesn't get quite as much airtime, both at a popular level, but even in the academy. If you're getting a degree in, say, theology uh, or religious studies, you probably maybe get a little section of a chapter on Zwingli, who we'll be talking about today, uh, but not a whole lot. And so you wrote a wonderful book called God's Armed Prophet, which is a provocative title. It comes from Machiavelli <laughs> there. We'll, we'll get into that in a bit, uh, but I can't recommend it enough. And if people want to check it out, they can use the link in the description that will be down below. But Zwingli is a complicated figure. He's remembered by different groups at different times in rather mutually exclusive ways. To some, he's a hero. Mm -hmm. To others, he's a villain. To some, he's this kind of expansive, enlightened humanist. And to others, he's a puritanical zealot. So mm -hmm. on a personal level, I'd just love to know, what drew you to studying this complicated figure? Well, I, I think you, you put your finger right on it. It's the complications of this this person the uh, extraordinarily contrary impulses that seem to be found in someone who in many ways imagines an entirely changed version of Christianity. It's 1525, very early in the Reformation, the year of the Peasants' War, that at Easter on Monday Thursday, a new liturgy of the Lord's Supper is celebrated in the major church in, in Zurich, unlike anything that's ever been before. There's no medieval uh, model for this. There's really no early Christian model for it. It is a, it is a new vision of a worshiping community and of a wider political community that has now become the established form of the Christian faith in a major center, the city of Zurich, which is not only an urban uh, polity, but is also a, la a large territorial uh, lordship. So in this, in this significant European city, an absolutely new form of Christianity is been brought about. And the principal person responsible for that was this man who was a former priest, who uh, had a very extensive theological education, who had served in military campaigns, who had had a very colorful past for which his opponents never ceased to remind him of. It's quite likely that as he was the reformer in the city, at least one of his illegitimate children was present in the city. Uh, we know of no other contact than that. He he marries, he adopts the children of his wife. It's a, it's, it's a life that has so many components to it. And the picture, the pieces don't fit together together very easily. And I remember as an undergraduate sitting in the uh, college library was, and I, I had seen this book on the shelf by George Potter called Swingley. I'd looked at it several times. So finally, I pulled it off the shelf and, and started to read it. And, I, you know, I came up through a reformed background. I knew of Calvin, I knew of Luther, but I didn't know much more. And I read this life and I thought, this isn't what I thought a reformer was meant to be like. This guy dies in a battle wearing armor. What's that about? And why have I never heard about this, this person? So that was a many, many years ago. But it, I then eventually in doing my doctoral work went into the field of the Swiss Reformation. So Zwingli's always been there. But the desire I had, and I wanted to wait until I had really felt that I had something to say. The desire was to come back to this complex figure who, as you say, gets mentioned, uh, not generally honorably, uh, but gets mentioned in most accounts of the Reformation, but with really just as a kind of side figure in the major drama. Uh, 
often as a prelude to Calvin or as Luther's opponent. But it, it stayed with me, this desire to try to make sense of this story of a man who seemed to have so many contrasting impulses. And I thought, well, you know, I'd had a, I had a go at writing a life of Calvin, who is in his own way extremely complicated. That really excited me about thinking about who these reformers were. Who did they believe that they, they, they were? What were the things that influenced them? And why was it possible in these figures that I had grown up and, and known as these great heroes of the Reformation, how is it that they were so much more complicated and in many ways much more interesting than I had ever known? So I decided to have a go at it. I love that. And I really loved what you do in the book of introducing us to Zwingli as this multifaceted person where you don't have to make all the pieces of the puzzle fit together nicely, that he can be a man of some contradictions. And I think for my audience, you know, for those who have heard of them, him, they might be tempted to think of him as just a, a theological figure. And I think so often we do our study of theology a disservice when we forget that like, these figures of the Reformation and all throughout church history are these people. Like they're not just ideas. They're, they're not just containers of ideas, but they're, they're these multi-layered, really interesting people. And so I think for those who are interested in the Reformation, they'll really enjoy getting a bit of this deep dive that we'll go through today and more in your book. And one of the the layers or facets of Zwingli that really stood out to me in your book was this idea of him as a humanist, because I think mm -hmm. at a popular level, we think of him as this iconoclast who kind of takes these beautiful medieval churches and strips them down and, you know, I think for some people kind of oversimplifies things. Mm -hmm. And that, that doesn't in some ways line up with this picture of him as a humanist that really surprised me. And so you write this, you write Zwingli who cherished the ancient Greek lyricist Pindar and repeatedly mm -hmm. read Plato was the poetic spirit of the Reformation. He loved music, created liturgy for worship and crafted an aesthetic of the spirit he was the artist, while his successor, Heinrich Bullinger, and Calvin in Geneva were the craftsmen. So could you kind of, could we double click on this idea a bit of <laughs> Zwingli as a humanist? Can flesh yeah. this out for us? Because I think it yeah. reveals interesting things about him. Yeah, it, it, it is one of the most remarkable things about this, this person is that he, at least, you know, to my mind, he was an extraordinarily creative mind and person. He was a great musician. He played about a dozen instruments, the, the very sort of um, everything from the sort of mandolin through to various uh, coronets and, and wind instruments. He composed songs, um, music that was performed that we know was uh, performed in in the household. He performed Greek tragedies in the uh, uh, in the city. Uh, he wrote the music for the performance of those of those Greek uh, tragedies. Uh, he he his writing um, his his is evocative of the natural world. It's he 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 evokes the world of the the Alps, where he grew up in in a, in an Alpine valley, uh, his writing is full of this profound sense of the the divine revelation in nature, much like Calvin will share later. But this this strong sense of the the beauty of creation, and that's something that's very distinctive of of Zwingli's voice that we have little sense of partially was because and this comes back to what you mentioned earlier he's so unfamiliar part of that is we have almost no good translations of his works they're not easily accessible um and so it's it's actually very difficult to 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 get access to to swingley in modern readable translations and much of it hasn't been translated. So we there's there's so much of him that we we don't know about unless you have access to the to the 16th century Swiss German or 
uh, his humanist Latin. But what about him as a humanist? Well, he has he is extremely well educated, and he, and he's recognized as a pro child prodigy. He's sent to study. Uh, uh, he comes from a peasant family, but it's a relatively well-to-do peasant family. He's sent to study in a nearby city. His musical ability is recognized from an early age. He's invited to enjoy to join the Dominicans because they so valued uh, musical ability. He doesn't do it. He studies at university. All the accounts we have was that he was this remarkably gifted student. But the humanism comes. He had a traditional scholastic education and Zwingli's scholasticism remains with him uh, all through his, his life. He, he by no means wholly rejects that. But the great influence in his life, of course, is Erasmus. Zwingli had studied in Basel. He was there when Erasmus was there. There's no, they, they, they didn't know each other until, until later. Zwingli was part of that circle of people who were absolutely enthralled by Erasmus's vision of the recovery of antiquity, of ancient literature, philosophy, history, that this recovery of the ancient world is not just some sort of academic exercise, but that, of course, it was the foundation for the renewal of Christianity. And the young Zwingli, who becomes a priest, is very intoxicated by Erasmus. He's reading everything Erasmus has written. He attributes Erasmus's writings to his own spiritual development. And right up to his, his first major conversion experience, which is around 1516, he, it is Erasmus who is shaping Zwingli's worldview. And to this end, Zwingli devotes himself to uh, not only to uh, perfecting his Latin, he was a brilliant Latinist, a, a great stylist. It's one of the reasons why Erasmus uh, originally took to Zwingli. He was very deeply impressed by Zwingli's learning and his ability to craft beautiful Latin. Zwingli took up the study of Greek uh, very early on, again from the inspiration of Erasmus. His Greek was very good. We have books from his early studies. We know that he was an extremely proficient reader of and writer of the language. So he embraced these humanist skills and humanist gifts as a true believer in the Erasmian ideal of the renewal of the church. Later, he will take up Hebrew, which Erasmus, of course, doesn't, and becomes a pretty competent Hebraist as well. So he he really embodies that humanist ideal of, of learning languages, studying the ancients, and using them as the foundation, as, as Erasmus spoke of, kind of baptizing antiquity. Zwingli believed that, that these, these humanist arts were going to reform the church from within. He absolutely embraces Erasmian ideal of, of the renewal of Christianity, and he belongs to that generation who were ecstatic with the appearance in 1516 of Erasmus's New Testament and the idea that, that you know, one studied these languages and that this would give us the pure gospel and that the pure gospel in terms of Erasmus's philosophy of Christ offered the way to the spiritual renewal of, of. so this 1516 Novum Instrumentum, the New Testament, is for Zwingli, uh, like so many of his contemporaries, the most extraordinary and most you know, enervating moment in, in their lives and, and creates this vision that now is the time. Of course, Luther will appear shortly thereafter. But when I, I try, I, I've t taught together with my colleague, uh, Volker Lepine, of course, on Zwingli and, and, and Luther together. And what we try to impress on the students is how incredibly exciting this was that was emanating from Erasmus in, in Basel. How incredibly exciting this was that learning and study and piety and renewal all now seemed possible. And then Luther will enter into this. So the humanism is, is central to who, who Zwingli was. It wasn't just academic learning. It was, it was the whole world of 
piety for him. Piety is a word, pietas. It's a whole disposition towards uh, the faith that that he sees through Erasmian uh, lenses. Yeah, and I think you even mentioned in the book that I think he starts like a school for young boys, right? Teaching mm -hmm. teaching Latin as well. And so this, this love, like you said, not, I mean, I suppose a school is academic, but it, it translates, you know, through into teaching others as well. We see this broad range of interest in languages and subject matter. And then you mentioned that he had this Erasmian ideal that baptizing antiquity would lead to reforming the church from within. Eventually that changes, or at least, yeah. uh, you know, it, it certainly seems to. And so maybe could you, could you talk us through some of that journey from this bright young priest who is remarkable for his learning mm -hmm. and is gaining followers, uh, but is also, you know, he's, he's preaching against mercenaries and he's mm -hmm. pr very pro-papal. Eventually mm -hmm. we have him then become a fiery reformer who's not convinced this is going to happen from within the church and well you know not to spoil the end but we have god's armed prophet who uh, dies with the sword and so maybe just take us a little bit how he goes from enamored with erasmus to yeah. eventually feeling that some of that's not even quite worthwhile anymore right that, that he really has to go to to scripture alone and that this is going to put him in conflict with the church but talk us through that transition a bit this video is brought to you in part by Faithful Counseling. Faithful Counseling is an organization of Christian counselors that exists to help you get the help you need. You can find them by going to faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity. And when you use that link, which you can find in the description down below, you will get 10% off your first month and they'll pair you up with a licensed mental health counselor in under 48 hours. Once you've been paired up with a counselor, you can reach them via instant message, phone call, video call, and more. I think you will really enjoy this, and I think it could be the first step on your journey to greater mental health. And mental health problems affect all of us, religious, non-religious, old, young, every demographic feels the weight of mental health. But there are resources available, and you don't need to go through this alone, which is why I encourage you to reach out to the amazing people at Faithful Counseling by using that link, faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity, and taking your first step towards healing and wholeness in your mental health. Sure. It's, um, he, he is, he's, for 10 years, he's a priest in a relatively obscure part of Eastern Switzerland in a valley called Glarus. He's the priest there. And as you say there, he's, he, in, in addition to carrying out his pastoral and sacramental role, he's educating boys and sending them off to school. So he, he, his humanism that I spoke about, and, and as you raise, is, is part of this belief that education is going to be the renewal, not only of the church, but of society. So Zwingli takes up teaching and many of these uh, people go on to significant careers and write about how inspirational Zwingli was as a teacher in preparing them to go off and into school uh, with Latin and, and languages and the ability to write. And they, he, they remember him very fondly. He, his, all of his career is caught up in a series of political questions. As a young priest in Glarus, he went with the mercenary armies down to Italy. He was at the scene of one of the most, or two, really two of the most bloody battles of the French-Italian wars in, in the early uh, 16th century. He, he sees the ex horrific slaughter of his countrymen at, in the service of foreign powers such as the Pope or the King of France. And this traumatizes him. It really is a form of PTSD that, that changes his life. And he comes back from this experience in Italy, a deeply shaken person. But he retains, as, as you say, his loyalty to the, to the papacy. This was traditional in the area that he came from. But the rivals were the supporters of the of the King of France, 
And he found in his uh, parish in Glarus that the sympathies were very pro-French and he was forced to leave. And he goes to the great Benedictine house at Einsiedel, which is in the center of Switzerland, still there today, an extraordinarily beautiful, now Baroque uh, uh, Benedictine house and also a school. And he went there Einsiedeln had an extraordinary library uh, where, where he had access now to all the books that he wanted, all the patristic texts, the medieval texts. And he was he was appointed to preach to the pilgrims who came to Einsiedeln for the Black Madonna. And he would preach to them. But when he was not preaching, he studied in the library. What seems to have happened, this is the year 1516, what seems to have happened is he had some sort of conversion experience. He never describes it in any great detail, but he talks about how he changes his preaching and he moves away from the lectionary to deciding that the way he's going to preach is that he's going to commence at the start of a biblical book and preach all the way through. He claims that Augustine is his inspiration for doing this. He, he mentions that studying Augustine's commentary on John was very ins inspirational for him, very formative for him. So he begins a new form of preaching. He preaches through biblical books, Lectio Continua, as it's, as it's referred to. So instead of following the lectionary, he's following the text. And this conversion really seems to be, and this is to go back to where I was before, to an Erasmian view of scripture, that of the interpretation of the whole text, the use of Greek, um, the Hebrew will really come a little later, but Greek and Latin for exegesis, and this emphasis on the centrality of Christ. So he seems to have had some sort of conversion experience that really brings him further into this Erasmian uh, ideal. And it's around that time that he starts having contact with Erasmus. And Erasmus responds to him through a mutual friend. Zwingli gets to visit Erasmus. And, and he, this is utterly thrilling for him. In fact, one of the great tragedies of his life, as far as he was concerned, was the break of his relationship with Erasmus. At the end of his life, he says that he still admired Erasmus above all others. And in fact, he says at one point, Erasmus warned me about Luther and I didn't listen. And so this was this is a complex psychological relationship that went past their 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 break. But in 1516, this time where the first conversion is, is where he really becomes focused on this idea of the authority of scripture. Now, this is where it gets into debates. Did Zwingli do this before Luther came along in 1517? I, I don't really get into this. I don't, I don't think that's a helpful discussion. Clearly, it, by 1516, Zwingli, and, Zwingli had a strong Erasmian sense of scripture. He become, he, he, his preaching is very attractive. It draws large following, including people from the city of Zurich, because it was traditional from the city of Zurich to come on pilgrimage at least once a year to the Benedictines at Einsiedel and the Black Madonna. So significant people were coming from the city of Zurich. They were hearing Zwingli preach. They knew that he was anti-French, anti-French mercenaries. And there was a huge debate in Zurich between the papal and the French parties. So the uh, the pro-papal people thought it would be good to bring this powerful voice to the city. So in 1519, he, at the end of 1518, he's elected into the city I ha on a divided vote. It's by no means agree there's agreement. And he enters uh, the city at the end of 1518 and at the beginning of January, the first day of January, 1519, he's, he is, he begins preaching in the Grossmünster, which is the major church in Zurich. He's still a priest at this point. He's still filled with a Resmian notion of, of, uh, renewal. There's been no break with the church. He, we think, but we don't have proof by this point. He's, he's reading Luther. But we don't know what exactly what the impact is. But certainly Luther's tracts were being printed in Switzerland, mostly in Basel, and circulated 
uh, to uh, to cities like Zurich. So there's there's no doubt that Zwingli by this point was aware of Luther, and certainly the Luther affair in Germany uh, would be well known in 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 Swiss lands. But he begins in 1519. He says, "I'm going to preach from the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew and continue all the way through." Uh, through the gospel and in fact through the new testament and that's becomes this is this is a, this is a break of course with the tradition it's hugely popular he draws large audiences he was clearly a gifted and charismatic preacher and he he introduced this but he's still he's still a, a priest the major turning point seems to be there is disputations within the city, but in the in the in the beginning of 1523, by that point, Zwingli has been changing his ideas about the Eucharist, uh, again influenced by Erasmus, but also influenced by greater awareness of Luther. In fact, Zwingli believes that he and Luther are saying much the same thing. So this year 1522 seems to be the crucial year in which Zwingli's ideas are shifting towards the rejection of transubstantiation, the rejection of the mass, and the rejection of, of the hierarchical authority of the church. There are several uh, uh, important moments in this. One is the what's called the, the sausage affair, which is uh, when Zwingli is present for, but doesn't participate, a breaking of the fast at which uh, sausages were, were eaten, so meat was consumed during Lent, uh, and this creates a public scandal. Zwingli very much is orchestrating this, this scandal. It's a, it's a bit of a PR stunt. Uh, he knows it's going to create confrontation. His, his uh, uh, he has followers that are meeting together in groups to read the Bible. It's part of this atmosphere of, of excitement about the authority of Scripture, and, and Zwingli is the focal point of this. So during this period, 1521, 1522, his ideas are shifting, and he's becoming uh, critical of central teachings of the Catholic Church, such as the, the intercession of the saints, the Mass, and the authority of of the priesthood, the 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 sausage incident that I I spoke about leads to Zwingli writing on human freedom, much as Luther had done in 1520. But in Zwingli uses the issue of food as uh, the basis you, from the Pauline texts, talking about the freedom of the conscience. So in this period, there's a kind of rapid development of of his ideas. But it's beginning of 1523 when there is now a uh, identifiable following of Zwingli in Zurich who are holding you know, what we can loosely call evangelicals in the sense that they were devoted to the scripture and were adopting Luther's I, you know, call to sola scriptura. Um, there is a debate in 1523 in January that's held between the Catholics and Zwingli's followers and it's a, and it's a radical moment because uh, Zwingli declares that the debate which he organized would take place in front of the ruling political authorities and that they, not the hierarchical church, would decide. They would make, this is a crucial moment, because they were given the power to make a theological decision. Now, the debate itself was pretty one-sided, as most of these disputations in the Reformation were. There was no doubt who was going to win. But nevertheless, it really is a formative moment when Zwingli seems to be thinking of the church in a profoundly new way, uh, which is, is the church, the local church is the universal church. Therefore, the local church could decide to embrace scripture and the preaching of scripture and the reforms that they saw that would follow from this. So in 1523, there's already um, a clear sense of, of a break. Uh, Zwingli is never uh, excommunicated like Luther is. There's some political reasons uh, for that. But already by 1523, Zurich is clearly going in a very different direction. It's starting a path in which it seems to be stepping away from the Catholic Church. And 
over the next year, 1523, 24, this is when the iconoclasm will happen, the removal of the images uh, from the church, uh, and culminating with the abolition of the mass, and as I mentioned earlier, the introduction of the, the new uh, reformed liturgy of the Lord's Supper at Easter 1525. So between 1523 and 20, well, early 25 is when the events are really taking shape, but Zwingli's own sort of thinking seems to be crystallizing around 1522. And uh, I think it's probably easiest for us to say that it's a combination of his own original ideas, but deeply indebted both to Erasmus and also to Luther. That incident you bring up there has one of the uh, kind of divide, or the, one of the breaking points of the, the sausage party there it is a fascinating one that, 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 that you described there as a PR stunt. I'd be curious, you also brought up the, the disputations and how they were they were kind of always going to be one-sided, not necessarily because Zwingli was going to be so much smarter than anyone who could ever talk to him, but because these are somewhat staged things to, mm -hmm. to go a certain way. Yeah. One question that often comes up when people are looking at the Reformation, and I think especially for my audience, or maybe trying to think about it theologically as well, as far as what's mm -hmm. going on there, is the kind of like the nature of the church and an internal critique and an external critique of, of what's happening here. And I'd be curious, do we have any sense from Zwingli? Does, does he hope that his reform movements are going to result in this internal change of the church eventually, that like the church is going to kind of be uh, renewed to a perhaps, you know, um, more pure state? Or does he think I'm really doing something new and the mm -hmm. train has gone off the tracks in Rome. The best we can do now is to to start start again. Do we have any sense of where he lands on that spectrum? Yeah, he, he, we do. He he um he, you know, as I, I mentioned earlier, when he arrives in Zurich in 1519 and over the next couple of years, I think it would be most correct to think of him as an Erasmian inspired priest. He's celebrating mass, he's carrying out pastoral uh, care, that was part of a major part of his job, he was preaching, he was performing his sacramental duties. I think the, the best way to describe what happens in really from about 1522 onwards is that he believes that Erasmus has pointed through scripture to the centrality of, of Christ and to a reading of the Bible that Zwingli then comes to believe doesn't support major aspects of the Catholic Church to which he served as a priest, notably the issue of uh, the intercession of the saints. He gets into a controversy about the the role of of Mary, but also uh, about increasingly doubting the verity of the mass, and he comes through his Erasmian biblicism as to a certain extent Erasmus does himself, to a deep, what begins as a kind of skepticism about a mass, to a belief that in fact it's idolatrous and has no foundation in scripture. In fact, it seems to be a, for, for him, he sees it as a desecration of scripture because is the, the argument that he formulates, it seems to suggest that Christ's sacrifice on the cross was not sufficient and needed to be repeated. That's the argument that he, he uses over and over again, that this idea that uh, the, re the re repetition of the, of the sacrifice was 
demonstrated a lack of belief that Christ's once offered sacrifice was sufficient. And that becomes, of course, a major part of the reformed critique of, of, of the mass. So he, he, he is really, um, the, his ideas are being driven through his intense study of scripture, his almost daily preaching, and also a growing belief during 1522 and into 1523 that the reform spirit of the Catholic Church, which he believed was there, uh, that, uh, that that spirit simply was not open to the gospel, and that, in fact, the institutional authority was going to be far more significant than any commitment to to scripture so he loses faith in the bishop he loses faith uh, ultimately in 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 the papacy he resigns his 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 pension from the papacy and ultimately he will resign his priestly office but he comes to believe that the catholic church as constituted is not going to reform itself it's going to set itself against the gospel and that's a a continuing theme in Zwingli's life that those who oppose the gospel are the true enemy. And he comes to believe that the hierarchical Catholic Church has set itself against the gospel, against the freedom of the gospel, and therefore it is no longer a true church. He doesn't really go to Luther's form of antichrist uh, and sort of apocalypticism. Um, he uses the term occasionally antichrist as as just what everybody did at that point, but that's not really Zwingli's perspective of, on this. For Zwingli, it is about the freedom of the gospel, and that's what he believed that Rome had shown that it was not going to accept, and therefore another way was going to be necessary. I see. And speaking of people that he becomes something of an enemy with. Uh, on the one hand, there's the papacy and the hierarchical Catholic Church. And on the other, there ends up being Luther, who you mentioned mm -hmm. at one point when he, he being Zwingli, uh, was thinking about the sacraments and the Eucharist. He thinks that him and Luther are saying kind of the same things. History would show that ultimately they'd have something of a falling out over this and did. The, you know the, uh, the rest of the reformation is history i suppose but talk yeah. to us a little bit about zwingli's view of the eucharist and I, I love when we were chatting right before we were recording which we could have done for hours um just it was so enjoyable but i i mentioned that a lot of people might think zwingli had this kind of lower view of the sacraments vis-a-vis -vis some of the other reformers and you said i, I don't think lower I, I think different and i'd love i'd love to uh get to that idea as well so zwingli on the eucharist how does he develop his thought and how does that differ from luther well it it yeah okay there's there's many aspects to this story he he the major influence on on Zwingli's Eucharistic, or certainly his early Eucharistic thought, is Erasmus. I know I keep saying this, but it's it's true. Zwingli derives a lot of his thinking about the Lord's Supper through an Erasmian critique, but also by embracing very strongly Erasmus's Pauline uh, interpretation, which for Zwingli becomes fundamental in the kind of separation of the material and the spiritual now you know this this may sound sound like it's a sort of maniche and it's 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 not that but for zwingli the conviction that really becomes the core of his sacramental thinking is that the spiritual cannot be sort of trapped in the material and that's the repeated accusation he gives against the mass is that that it cannot really truly be the body of Christ because that is reducing the the spiritual to a material form and so for Zwingli you know quoting John 6 is is always the spirit is is what 
uh, gives life, the flesh is what kills. And that's that's a, a kind of a Rasmian spirit that he has that is really at the heart of who, who he became. The extraordinary emphasis on the spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit, and the spiritual nature of of Christianity. And that's how he sees uh, the Eucharist, is that it is uh, for him, This it's not by any means uh, uh, a peripheral part of the Christian life. It's, it's absolutely central. But, of course, he denies that it is the, the you know, that, that, it, that as in a way that Luther will not, uh, he denies that Christ is physically present in the sacrament, in the bread and the wine. Zwingli's classic argument, which be again becomes uh, a, a part of the Reformation furniture, is, of course, that Christ ascended into heaven and was at the right hand of the Father and no longer physically present in the world, that Christ is present in the world spiritually. So therefore, the meal is a spiritual meal. Now, the, but in Swingley's mind, this was by no means a kind of demotion of the sacrament. He does not anywhere. He has a very, very high view of the sacraments, but he views them in an entirely different way. And, and I think one of the most damaging things that gets said here, and I'm not, you know, offering this as an apologist, but one of the most damaging things that's said about Swingley, because it's already said by his opponents in 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 his own day, is that uh, this is a kind of bare memorialism, that uh, that this kind of empty ritual of bread and wine is is nothing more than a kind of intellective act of memory that or reenacting of of a meal but that there that, that nothing really happens that's not how Zwingli thought about this at all he had he you know this goes back to the the discussion earlier about Zwingli as this artist and this very creative person I think it's it's no um coincidence that the first act of the Reformation in Zurich is a liturgy of the Lord's Supper. That's where Zwingli saw as the heart of the community. But he viewed it in, in a very different way. He creates this, this liturgy in which, of course, it's not performed at an altar by distant priests. It's performed on a table which is placed in the center of the community. It's not a wafer, but it is in fact normal baked bread. Uh, it is in a, in a wooden plate with a wooden chalice with wine, the simplicity of the elements. But for Zwingli, this simplicity was its, its beauty, that the bread and wine of the liturgy were the focal point, the visual focal point, together with the, with the pulpit, of this unity of word and sacrament together and when he speaks about the memorial, and, and Zwingli believes that the sacrament is is a he he speaks at a very early point that the sacrament is the is the is the Passover meal, and so it is the the memory of salvation, it is the memory of Christ giving his body, but memory for Zwingli, Zwingli is a deep Platonist, and, and, and for him, memory, memoria for him, is not simply a kind of recollection of what happened. Zwingli believed that in, through faith, in the sacrament of, of, of the Lord's Supper, the people were absolutely transformed, that memoria was actually in, in the medieval and mystical tradition of imitatio and emulatio, that memoria was actually that people were brought out of themselves through a work of, of the Holy Spirit, through the act of, through, through faith, and joined into this sort of spiritual community that was, that contemplated 
the divine. He actually, I, I would, I, the more I've read Swingley, the, the more I realized there is a kind of profound mysticism to what he thinks happens in this. But it's not the bread and the wine are transformed. In many ways, it's the community that's transformed through the Holy Spirit. And this for him was the absolute heart of not only of the church, but of the community it's, itself. And, and, and he believed passionately that, that to, to argue that Christ was physically present in this was to, was to, uh, was to deny the purely spiritual experience of, of this meal. Christ was no longer physically present in the world, but Christ was present. He talks about, he's, he says, he doesn't deny real presence. He says, of course, Christ is present, but he's present in the Holy Spirit. And that's for, that's Swingley, if you want to give him a kind of term, is very much a, is a theologian of the, of the Holy Spirit. It's a powerful spiritualism, which is, you know, one of the reasons why it's not surprising that many of the spiritualist movements, more radical spiritual movements, such as the Anabaptists and others, are deeply inspired by by Zwingli because of this heavy emphasis on the role of the spirit. And 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 so, you know, that's I think is is the way you need to think about his sacraments, whatever you think of it. Um, and there's lots to debate here, but it's the idea that it's some sort of bare memorialism, a kind of empty ritual, um, that's simply not how he saw it at all. I imagine it says something about our own theology that when we hear someone like Zwingli say that uh, Christ is present in the spirit or Christ is spiritually present in this, we somehow take that to mean less real or yeah. it's a, a less, uh, yeah, a less real presence, which I think probably says more uh, about us than perhaps him. It, it's an interesting way of reflecting on that thinking, I think. Huh? Yeah, I mean, for him, and of course, this this feeds into Calvin as well. It, you know, the heart of the meal is contemplatio. It's 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 a kind of mysticism, and 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 so you know, he thought it was absolutely beautiful what you know what took place at at the meal. And so, you know, this is this is this is not some sort of empty, empty uh, moment. This is this is a profoundly sacred moment. And he does he designs a liturgy that's really quite in, in its simplicity is really quite beautiful. And and, you know, the iconoclasm, which, you know, we can we can talk about. It's not just a kind of stripping of the church, which is, of course, is the way in which it's usually presented. But you know, I would argue it was actually Zwingli, the artist, creating a different aesthetic, which was which was done through sort of light, and um, the the use of light and the simplicity, the whitewashing of the walls. I mean, co the, this choice of of color was not just block, was not just covering up something. It was actually creating a new aesthetic that 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 res that was to reflect. The presence of the Holy Spirit, so it's 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 not just knocking down. It's a it's a new aesthetic notion of liturgical worship that Zwingli is doing. That's something I'm, you know, wanted to convey quite strongly. That what again, whatever you think about it, I'm I'm not here to sell it, uh, but it, whatever you think about it, it's actually a vision, not just a kind of taking an axe to things. Yeah, and let's turn there because I think that's an area that people think they know Zwingli, or at least they associate him with, is this kind of iconoclasm. I love how you talk about there's a there's a vision here. It's not just a stripping away. It's not just this is bad, and so let's hack it all to pieces. But there's something uh, constructive to it as well as perhaps like a, a deconstructive layer to it. And I also want to hit on this because this was utterly fascinating to me, is that this stripping of the altars, if you will, it it also ties in with care for the poor, which is yeah. not something that I would have connected. If again, if you're thinking about these only as ideas, if you're thinking of Zwingli as this this container of uh, various theological points, you might miss something like this. And so let let's talk a little bit more about the 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 change, let's maybe not even just say stripping, but the, the change of the aesthetic in the churches, um, what he's doing there and how that also connects to the poor. I think that's really interesting. Yeah, this is this is a theme that that 
is found in Zwingli right from the earliest parts of his his preaching. It's it's very interesting. What in 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 2019 for the anniversary of Swing, the 500th anniversary of his arrival in in Zurich, um, a film came out, a Swiss film by a, a director named Stefan Haut uh, about Zwingli, and it's a very um, high budget production, in, incredibly well done. But it all it's a it's it's a film about Zwingli intended for a secular audience. And one of the elements that it stresses is Zwingli as the social reformer. And of course, that's one way of making him more palatable to a, a modern audience. But there's a serious grain of truth in this, that Zwingli believed that the renewal of the church was intimately bound to the renewal of society. And this is where, you know, he is right at the forefront of what will become a pillar of reformed Christianity. And that is that, that spiritual renewal is, is um, the foundation for the renewal of society. And the creation, not of any perfect state, but the growing of the image of God as the foundation of the community. So that there was a sense that, that through worship and through pious living in the house, through righteous government, through fair trade practices, all of this were seen as intimately connected parts of how the gospel was going to transform society. It was never going to be perfect. But it was, but it was a step by step development, and that was Swingley's vision, that there would be a godly society. Now we know, of course, therein lies the roots of so much of what became Puritanism and other forms of, of, of Protestantism. But Swingley is really at the forefront of this, and for Swingley, there was, a particular care for the poor. And the in, the issue of iconoclasm, in in Zurich, which came, followed on, on much of his preaching, one of the most powerful arguments that came out of the iconoclasm debate was that the money that was being poured into the churches for all the various charitable functions uh, connected with medieval devotion, that these should really be put in the service of the poor that these that these that these that this wealth belonged not to the church but to the poor and that that was the gospel command and Zwingli was absolutely uh, persuaded of this and many of his followers even those who become the radicals or so the Anabaptists uh, have this strong emphasis that the goods of the church should be for the service of the poor. And so this theme is very strong in the iconoclasm debates of 1524-1525, that, that the stripping of the church wasn't just the removal of what was there, but it was also to serve the social welfare of the community through the building of hospitals, through uh, all sorts of other charitable um, institutions that would care for widows, would care for orphans, would care for the poor. And the introduction of the Reformation in Zurich, like in other places, often was accompanied by new laws for poor relief. And that poor relief became as closely connected with the introduction of the evangelical uh, church orders beginning in in Zurich that that this was seen as a true sign of the Christian piety of the church was how it looked after the the poor and tried to eradicate begging as well as other things such as prostitution and other issues so this this commitment to moral and societal reform which is at the heart of of Zwingli's vision and is at the heart of the Zurich Reformation is you know, formative of in in this aspect of the reformed tradition that would follow, 
just have to look at Calvin and, you know, the creation of when the fourfold ministry, the diaconate. The diaconate is to care for the poor. These are, these are traditions that have evolved out of Zurich. If his social reform makes him a bit more palatable to us 500 years later, his death might do the opposite for many. And I think we'd be remiss if we didn't touch on uh, the, the nature of his death, which uh, brought ire on him from Luther mm -hmm. and uh, perhaps grants the book uh, the provocative title, God's Armed Prophet. So could mm -hmm. you give us just a little bit of a sketch of uh, how he died and what, what led to that? Sure. He, it's not just Luther. I mean, some of Zwingli's closest friends, such as Ecolampadius in Basel and Martin Bootser, who was in Strasbourg, believed that this had been a terrible, terrible miscalculation. And I think, you know, there are various ways. One of the things is, and I, I, I explore this in the book, is that you know, one of the complexities of Swingley, and I think you mentioned this right at the beginning, is that he's traumatized. He, he preaches against the mercenaries in, in Swiss culture, which, you know, was in many ways preaching against a, a very popular thing. I mean, it might be like opposing sports gambling now. You know, it's, it's, it's a popular thing that you decry as, as, as morally problematic but you know Zwingli took a strong voice against mercenaries but mercenaries were the way most people made a survival in you know Switzerland in the 16th century was not a wealthy place unlike today uh, and mercenary service was a way in which young men could find a way of living so he preached against this he had that horrific experience in Italy he was traumatized by war but yet if you look at his writings he refers to Christ as our captain there's a kind of martial language that runs through Swingley's uh, writings his preaching all of his life so what happens at the end doesn't come out of out of nowhere but he becomes deeply I mean deeply I don't want to say disillusioned, but deeply troubled that he believes that there are human forces such as Catholic authorities, but also other authorities who he thinks are lukewarm on the gospel, who are preventing the people from hearing the word of God. And it's not fair to say that he's 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 some sort of military zealot. At, at, at various points, he says, this is this is not what should happen. But over a period of time, really from about 1526 onwards, he dies in 1531, he's starting to see that force might be necessary to make the gospel available to his Swiss brethren to whom he believed it was being denied. And he, he thinks that the the political machinations of, of, of Catholic authorities uh, is really um, thwarting the gospel. He also believes that there are people who, you know, nominally have embraced the Reformation, who are not really to do, willing to do what needs to be done to spread the word of God. There's a whole series of political things that happens. There's lots of issues of alliances, and, and I won't go into this. But I think there is an element with Swingley that as he gets to the, ends of the end of the 1520s, he's deeply disappointed. He's becoming somewhat radicalized. He feels that Zurich has, has failed to live up to the Reformation. He sometimes thinks he, he's going to have to leave. Um, there's a certain desperation that happens. And it's clear you know, through the letters. Um, he, he believes that with the break with Luther, that um, the Protestant unity that he'd hoped for wasn't going to happen. And he believed that if the, if the gospel was going to, to be spread, something dr drastic was going to have to happen. And military force was going to be necessary to break 
the impasse. He never held that to be a good thing, but he thought that that, he came to think that that was the only way it was going to be possible. I think if it was a disastrous miscalculation and the war, uh, he, he, he essentially uh, provokes a war for which the city of Zurich is, is not prepared and is woefully undermanned. Uh, it's it's not a it's not really a war. It's it's a kind of botched battle, uh, in which the the ill prepared Zurich troops are um, surprised in the night, ambushed, uh, and in some sort of battle, Zwingli is killed. There's all sorts of stories about how he died. Some of them probably apocryphal, but that he died a great you know hero. It, we don't know about whether he was killing people in this battle. We don't know exactly what he was doing, but he was he was killed in what was a lopsided uh, uh, military conflict that was a complete disaster. And so it was an inglorious end, and nobody knew what to do with this. This reformer who had preached, who had led the city through dramatic and dramatic changes in a relatively short period of time was suddenly dead and 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 there's this utter crisis nobody knew what to make of this um and it it created chaos and many in the city of zurich turned on zwingli and said you took us into this war he took us into this war that nobody wanted we've been humiliated uh, this, you know, the, our, our, our economy has been destroyed. Everything has been for this religious fanatic. And suddenly, after his death, Swingley became this reviled figure. And there's, there was a lot of talk that at that point, Zurich would go back to the Catholic Church. There was no funeral for him. There was no, there was no form of memorial. He simply, as I, I say in the book, he simply disappeared. And the Reformation hung by a thread in this period of 1531, in the fall of 1531, when he's killed at the Battle of Kappel on October 11th. There's chaos, there's this vacuum into which, and I don't want to create a kind of savior figure, but into which comes the young Heinrich Bullinger, and who proves to be, although he's a very young man, an incredibly person who's, who's with a visionary in many ways, but also is politically very savvy, and he will then begin the slow process of rebuilding the church. But the consequence was that that nobody knew what to do about Zwingli. Of course, Luther said, you know, lives by the door, sword, dies by the sword, and believed that you know Zwingli had shown his true colors as a not as a true Christian. Uh, but even as I say, his his friends were in crisis. Many were deeply depressed. They didn't know what to make of this that had happened, and it became that he 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 his this event became so difficult to talk about that it was largely avoided. So that in much of the 16th century, particularly in reform circles, and particularly with someone like John Calvin, they just didn't talk about Zwingli, and that's part of the role why he part of the reason why he disappears. Nobody knew what to make of this death, um, this catastrophe, and you know how do you how do you turn that? There were efforts in the nineteenth century to turn it into a kind of noble martyrdom, and there is a kind of tradition. The first biography of Swingley writes of him as a kind of martyr, but not many people buy that story. They just don't know what to do with him, and in a way, to this day, we still don't really know what to do with him. Well, perhaps it's unfair then to uh, land the plane with this question uh, after we've noted that he's a complex figure and we still don't really know what to do with him. But we began the conversation by saying he has a complicated legacy. He's a lot of different mm -hmm. things to a lot of different people. And I think this conversation, if anything, has shown that he's a figure that defies a neat and tidy characterization. But I'd be curious, just kind of on a personal level, for you... How do you remember Zwingli? What, what's his legacy for you after spending so much time studying him? I think, you know, it's like 
so many complicated figures. You can draw aspects out of it which are uh, admirable and and edifying and transformative. But it's very hard to place them in the whole person and in light of what happened. To read Zwingli in, in a good translation or in the original is to, like Calvin, is to be in the hands of a beautiful, beautiful writer. And I find Zwingli has, of course, a doctrine of election and predestination. It's, it's not, it, he's, he's much in his theology, much heavier emphasis on providence. But it's, you know, to, to our modern eyes, it's an incredibly, it's an incredibly uplifting vision of the Christian life and, and of the, um, of God as the sovereignty of God, but of the goodness of God. And Zwingli describes the Christian life as being one of joy. And, you know, to my knowledge, he is, he is in some ways one of the most optimistic of certainly of the reformed tradition. He has this extraordinary sense of the beautiful. And, and to read Zwingli, at least part of him, is to is to I, I find poetic and beautiful and uplifting. Then you can read what he says about Anabaptists, which can be vitriolic, uh, uh, extraordinarily harsh and vindictive. So the attraction for me, in many ways, is both the beauty of this person's vision. But I would also say the attraction for me is the, the, the contradictoriness, the, the fact that he is a person in whom there's so much that doesn't easily fit together. And although I spent all this time with him and I wrote about him, I'm still puzzling about this person in whom so many different things seem to be happening at the same time. He was described as a loving father. All the accounts of him say he that was extremely funny and good company. He was a talented musician, but he's also, you know, the, the, the armed prophet. He's, he's, and I'm fascinated by human character and I'm, I'm fascinated by the, the lack of consistency in all our lives. And one of the things I always say to our students is that we should never expect a uh, greater coherence from figures in the past than we would expect of ourselves. And one of the things I, I do in with, with students in teaching is, is to, to show the humanity, or at least to try to impart that the humanity of the Reformation. Zwingli never sat in a quietly in a study writing theology. All of his works were written at great speed, often in the middle of the night, so that he could have them with the printing press in the morning, almost all of them dictated by the current debates of the time. He's fighting fires continuously. And and his his theology is very much a lived theology. It's it's unfolding not in the way that he would have probably just wanted it to, but it's unfolding as events are unfolding, and nobody knows where this is going. Nobody knew where the Reformation was going. Nobody knew what the what where this was uh, going to end up, and I'm fascinated by this person who's just living in this torrent trying to make sense of it, trying to articulate his vision of, of God's world, and yet deeply troubled and ultimately victim of his own human weakness.
Dr. Gordon, this has been such a pleasure. And if that description at the end doesn't have people ready to go dive into the wonderful and weird figure that is Ulrich Zwingli, I think uh, I don't know what will. And I, I think it might have some people ready to uh, to send in their application to uh, to Yale, where you teach, to take some some classes with you. This has been such Brother, a pleasure. We're very welcome. <laughs> thank well, you so thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes, and I think we will we will end there, but this has been such an absolute privilege and joy. And thanks to all of you who watch this video sometime in the future. I don't take your time lightly either. <laughs>